In past episodes, we've spoken a lot about the Canaanites, the Phoenicians, how they were seafaring people who sold their merchandise all over the Mediterranean. This is also where we get things like maritime law. Well, up in Northern Europe, the Vikings were also seafaring people discovering many, many, many lands, including the American continent, long before Christopher Columbus. In fact, if you are white or have any type of European descent, you probably have a little bit of the Scandinavian DNA. This is because the Vikings pillaged all over Europe. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. Also, a very special thank you to all of our patrons. We have picked up quite a few patrons this week, and I am so appreciative of your support. If you would like to help support the channel, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today, on Mystery Monday, in part three of our Hollow Earth series, we are gonna be talking about the missing people of Greenland. Now this is a story I stumbled upon while doing my research for the Hollow Earth. To be honest with you guys, when I first contemplating doing a video on Hollow Earth, I thought it would be one simple video. But oh my gosh, this rabbit hole is deep. In fact, this rabbit hole is so deep, if we keep digging down the rabbit hole, we might find ourselves actually in the Hollow Earth. Now this story that I'm going to tell you all today is one of many concerning phenomenon allegedly around the idea of a portal into Middle, Inner, or the Hollow Earth. In part two, which I released on Friday, we talked a lot about Agartha. Agartha is supposedly the name of the kingdom that exists inside of our planet. Admiral Byrd himself allegedly, according to his diaries, flew a plane in through the portal at the North Pole where he had communication with the beings that lived in Agartha. If you have not seen the episode from Friday, part two will be in the description box down below as well as part one. Now this mystery I again stumbled upon while I was researching Agartha. And to be honest with you guys, there's not a lot of information out there about what happened to approximately 100,000 people in the year 1410. Now, of course, Greenland itself is, for most people, inhabitable. I know for myself, being from the South, I do not do well in cold weather. I like visiting places like Colorado where there's snow, but I don't know if I actually want to live somewhere where there's snow. Where I live in the world, if they even think we might get snow, possibility of some flurries. Here in Georgia, they will close down the whole state. Frankly, we just don't have the equipment or the know-how to handle that kind of weather. But we sure do know how to handle the heat. Now, heretically for me, my body, my genetics are technically made for cold weather. In fact, blue eyes, like my eyes, allegedly don't have as much of a likelihood of suffering from snow blindness. Fair skin, fair hair also is from colder temperatures. And when we think of the Vikings, when we think of Scandinavia, we often think of blonde-haired, blue-eyed, or red-haired, blue-eyed Norsemen who are able to handle cold weather. And so, besides Inuit people, or people who are indigenous to this area, the Vikings, or the Nordic people, the Scandinavian people, are probably the next 
best selection of people to be able to survive in a cold tundra. Eric the Red was a Norse explorer who was born around the year 950 AD. He was called Eric the Red because of his red hair. Now before Eric was born in the year 874, the Nordic people had already started to settle into areas like Iceland. And by the time Eric was 10 years old, his father had been exiled from their home in Norway. He had been exiled because apparently he had killed someone and that's how the Vikings, the Scandinavian Norsemen, handled these types of situation. They just exiled people. As time went on with Eric and his family's life in Iceland, Eric ended up meeting a woman and getting married. They had four children, one daughter and three boys. One of Eric's sons would go on to become the very famous Leif Erikson, who probably ranks above his old dad, Eric the Red, in areas explored. A comical situation happened with this family. At this point, the Christian faith was starting to spread all over Northern Europe. These Nordic people had practiced a very Viking-esque faith, believing in multiple gods, just like their Roman counterparts to the South many hundreds of years before. Now, Leif Erikson's Eric the Red son, his famous sun explorer, ended up converting to the Christian faith along with his wife. Well, Eric's wife also ended up converting to the Christian faith, and it is said that she was so upset with her husband, Eric the Red, for not giving up his Nordic faith that she withheld her wifely duties. I don't know why I found that funny. I guess it's just... <laughs> A sign that humanity never really changes. I could see something like that happening today. The power a woman holds over a man is a lot of power when it comes to those types of uh, marital situations. Around the year 892, the same thing happened to Eric that had happened to his father before him, which had relocated his family to Iceland. Apparently, there was some sort of situation with Eric's um, helpers on his property. I don't know what they were called back then. I don't know if they were paid, but they basically worked for Eric. There had been a bit of like a mudslide and some stuff had rolled into his neighbor's property and his neighbor got mad and like killed the helpers which then Eric got mad so he turned around and like killed the neighbor and it was just all sorts of a telenovela going on in Iceland. Well Eric then became exiled for his participation in the um, killing of his neighbor for his neighbor retaliating against Eric's helpers, which they probably weren't paid helpers if you know what I mean, but I'm not super clear on that, so. Well, instead of just sitting in some foreign land, twiddling his thumbs for three years before he was allowed to return back to Iceland to his Christian wife who was withholding her marital relations from her husband, he decided that he was going to explore. At this point, this is when Eric stumbled upon Greenland. Now, with the exploration and the settlement of Greenland, two different towns popped up, one on the west and one on the east. This is pretty much how it still looks today on a map because a lot of Greenland cannot be lived on. In fact, as it stands today, Greenland is the largest island on our planet and it only has 60,000 people living on it. However, as I said in the beginning, by 1410, 100,000 people had vanished. After Eric the Red discovered Greenland and was allowed to return back to Iceland, he ended up leaving with 25 ships full of people to settle the island. Unfortunately, 11 of those ships were lost at sea, but 14 made it. Now the story goes that Eric the Red advertised Greenland as Greenland because he wanted people to believe that it was a beautiful, lush, prosperous 
island or landmass to start a new settlement. However, I have my suspicions. Yes, I remember being taught that in school, that he called it Greenland as like a marketing campaign in the 900s. But you see, the Inuits already had a legend of an area called the Land of the Endless Summers. The people who were indigenous to this area allegedly knew that there was a portal at the North Pole that took you into a very tropical and green land. Of course, again, this is the same luscious green land that Admiral Byrd allegedly flew his plane into. The Rainbow City, or as we know it now, Agartha. So I wonder if Eric the Red was not trying to market Greenland to get people to go live on a cold, cold, icy island, but maybe Eric the Red also had some knowledge of what was beyond the North Pole. But whatever the truth is regarding what Eric knew or didn't know about this continent of Greenland, by 1410, 100,000 people of Viking descent were living in Greenland. And then, overnight, they vanished. Now, the Inuit people will tell you exactly what happened. The Vikings packed up and went to live in the land of endless summers. They made their passage through the portal at the North Pole to live in a place that was a little bit more friendly environmentally. Now this still is a mystery because of course the official narrative is that our earth is dense with lava and rock, no towns, no cities. But the Inuit people of Greenland, well they still know exactly what happened to those Vikings. The same thing that happened to Admiral Byrd when he decided to explore the North Pole. So what are your thoughts? Do you think the 100,000 people of Vikings living in Greenland in 1410 up and moved to Agartha? Or do you think something else happened to them? Many people might like to claim that potentially there was some struggle between the Inuits, the indigenous people of Greenland, and the people of Viking descent, but from what I could see, they seem to get along pretty well. And In fact, today, most people that live in Greenland are a mixture of both Viking and Inuit. And to be honest with you guys, out of all the research I've done on so many different topics, the truth is rarely the official narrative. And I tend to believe that those Vikings went to live in a place of endless summers. But what do you think? What do you think happened to the Vikings living in Greenland? Also, what do you think about the name Greenland? Do you believe that Eric the Red named it Greenland just as a marketing ploy? Or do you think he knew a little bit more about this entrance to an actual Greenland through the North Pole? I would love to hear your comments down in the comment section below. I hope you guys all have a fantastic week ahead. I've got some extra videos coming at you guys with some special guests. So hang tight. It is going to be a very exciting week. Thank you again to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the full song that we use as our opening song, there is again a link down in the description box below. And thank you to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out to you guys. Also, please don't forget tomorrow night, Tuesday night, I will be back on The Dark Outpost with our introduction to the banned or heretical book of Jubilee. There will be a follow-up episode on this channel on Wednesday, but of course I can go deeper into these scandalous works on David's platform. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon. Bye.